Nice. All right. Well, let's kick it off here. We're here with Hannah from Agency 102. Did I get that right? Yeah. Let me make sure uh, here. And Hannah is the content marketing expert. So really excited to get some of your uh, insights today about how we can use content to drive more traffic and, and more sales for our e-commerce sites. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to share my knowledge. Awesome. Um, so before we get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about Agency 102 and what exactly it is that you do? Yeah, that sounds great. So Agency 102 is a content marketing agency based in the Baltimore area, but we serve clients um, across the country. So um, very specialized right now in small to mid-sized businesses, but um, can support larger ones as well. And anything content marketing to help our clients attract, nurture, um, and, and just engage their current uh, prospects or client list. We do a lot of social media marketing, um, organic social media, email marketing, um, organic website content, um, blogging. So really anything that requires our clients to create content, that's where we really shine. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation with PPC Pitbulls too, because I think we do a lot of great uh, complementary things. And I know we'll get into how paid and organic tactics can work together, but I'm um, really excited to have a conversation. Definitely. So I think you touched on it a little bit there, but I think before we dive too deep, I'd love if you would give like, I always, when I hear content, I, my first thought is like blog posts. And then you also have the, the social stuff and, you know, we've been doing uh, some email outreach recently. So I feel like be really interested to hear just like what exactly do you mean when you say content marketing and, and maybe why is it important? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think um, now more than ever, content has become such an important part of marketing. Um, you know, clients we're coming to realize don't understand that, for example, Google, you know, favors websites that updates their content regularly and content meets the needs of users in different parts of the user journey. So um, really content marketing is figuring out what needs to be said um, and where and when. Um, and we help our clients figure that that part out, um, just really using content um, as a means to both sell your product, but more importantly, educate users, engage users. Um, and there's a crazy stat out there that's like content marketing is three times more effective than traditional marketing efforts. Um, people don't want to be talked at necessarily, which sometimes traditional marketing efforts can seem like, um, where content marketing is more engaging them in a conversation that they want to have. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. We always try to focus on that, like, especially on the paid side where we're, we're really, you know, obviously it's kind of transactional, you're paying for a click, um, but it is really just so important that you have that focus of like, how are we building an authentic relationship here? Because it, you know, it's not at the end of the day, people want to connect with their brands and connect with the, the people that they're buying things from. Absolutely. Yep. You know, something I think is kind of interesting, too, I feel like Google's shifting even from the PPC side in terms of when we look at things like relevancy and quality score in our ads, Google's really pushing. They want content that is relevant and makes sense and builds that relationship and really just answers their questions when people are Googling and clicking on ads. So I feel like it's getting pushed across all spectrums of marketing that we really need to be serving our audience. And I kind of love that content marketing. That's just like the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's definitely more about user intent these days. I feel like, you know, meeting them for what they need and not necessarily the message that you just want to push across to them. Definitely. Before yeah. we get into mis like the top mistakes, I kind of wanted to just throw this out here and see what your <laughs> thoughts were. So feel free to push back if you don't have any, because <laughs> I know it's kind of off the cuff, but what are your thoughts on AI generated content? I know that's a big thing right now and there's just so much conversation around it. I kind of just wanted to get your, your two cents. That is a really great question. And I don't think I've been asked that one before. Um, I've seen those like Facebook ads of like, hey, this ad was created by a robot. Um, look how effective this is. And to be honest, like, I think I need a little bit more research to understand it. But initially, I can see where there might be efficiencies with something like that. For example, if you have to churn out hundreds of different types of ad headlines really quickly, that could probably be something that's useful. But taking the human element out is, you know, not only in marketing, but in other areas, it, it can also lose that impact a little bit. So there's definitely probably pros and cons with using AI. 
Yeah, definitely. And I know that Google's come out and said that they're taking into consideration and that they're they're able to spot AI generated content and will be <laughs> uh, ranking accordingly. I'm not sure how they could do that, but I completely agree. I think the human element is 100% necessary, but it's just kind of a, a huge wave right now, especially yeah. in, in content generation. Well, it's interesting. I think we've seen like we've played with it a little bit, not not really using it on any clients yet, but just just checking it out. And it's amazing what it can generate. Like a lot of it really sounds real, but I think the thing to remember is you can't create any really new ideas, right? I mean, it's able to search out there and put together a bunch of different thoughts from different sources on the web. And, you know, these days I feel like chain them together in really well-written sentences, but it's still not, you know, driving the needle forward and kind of producing new information or, you know, finding specifically the information that your customer needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like there's a time and place for AI and that sort of technology. And I see it more being helpful, maybe on the back end with uncovering like insights and data, but that will help influence the writing from an actual person. I, so I, I definitely think there's a way to work together with tools like that. But again, just like raw copy made from a, a robot or not a robot, but you know what I mean? It's, it just is an interesting concept. Yeah. I'm curious. And again, we do, we want to get into some of the, you know, thoughts about what people can do around writing good content or having good content on their site, but um, kind of staying on like the basic thing, could you talk a little bit more about like, how do you partner with uh, businesses that need content on the site? Are you writing for them specifically? Are you like helping to guide strategy? Like if somebody's just getting started, needs to get some more content out there to really start to build more customer relationships, um, you know, what, what should they expect when they're partnering with an agency or should they even partner with an agency right away or should they be doing it themselves? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. Um, just kind of shedding light on that experience, especially for some of the smaller businesses we've worked with, because they might not have a large marketing team or one at all. It might just be the owner who has to kind of get stuff started himself or herself. Um, and so, some some of the process that we do is we we they recognize their need of you know we need to build awareness in the community or we want to appear in these certain searches when somebody's looking for us um, and so we are introduced and start a partnership off um, we typically like to do this initial like discovery phase with them where um, we get to get to know their business their brand and their goals and then from like a competitor standpoint we check out local competitors see what their sites their social channels look like. Um, and that allows us to kind of give the, the client a game plan of this is what's performing really well. And this is what your competitors are doing. Here are some gaps and opportunities where we can really outshine them. And then we kind of build this content strategy plan of whether it might be a website update where we help them re, re up, you know, update their site map or even add organic content, new pages. Um, so we really like to build that foundation with our clients, um, especially ones who haven't worked with a marketing agency before, just kind of ease them in, but also make sure that foundation is really strong before we just, you know, get out and, and work really fast on content or something like that. We want to make sure it's right the first time. That's great. Yeah, I think that's the, I, I love that, like taking the time to really get to know the business and getting to know kind of the voice and, and what the customers actually need to hear before you just go and start generating a bunch of posts or a bunch yep. of blogs or whatever. So that's great. What about video? We're, I, you know, everything we hear these days is video is the wave of the future and that's where everything's going. Um, I always like question like how much can, you know, we're thinking about ranking and, and you know, Obviously, I enjoy consuming video, but like how much can like Google rank us with video content as opposed to like text content that they can parse? Um, but yeah, I don't know if you could speak to that at all. Like where, you know, what should people be doing with video these days? Oh my gosh, as much as possible, I'd say. So what we're doing here is great. Um, you know, even from an organic social standpoint, and Andy, I know you mentioned you subscribed to my LinkedIn newsletter, but yesterday I posted something about um, a client meeting that we had this week where we showcased um, performance of an Instagram static post versus an Instagram reel. And side by side, it was just astounding how much more reach, engagement, saves, shares the reel got versus the static post. And our client even was like, oh, wow, I guess the slide's telling us that we definitely need to do more video. Um, and it's true. I mean, Instagram's trying to compete with TikTok. 
And even the owner of Instagram or the director of, con- I forget his, his title, but he was like, we're no longer a photo sharing app for video. And so I think that's kind of the trajectory for a lot of different platforms, whether that is also how Google, you know, crawls sites and favors content. Um, so I think video is definitely something that needs to be on the client's priority list in the future. Yeah. I know that's overwhelming for a lot of clients too. Like it's hard enough to, you know, create text-based content. And especially if you're trying to outsource to an agency, it's, you know, you can have somebody else write your post, but it's awfully tough to do like a founder led video. Do you have any suggestions around that or like how to kind of get started with it? Yeah. um, And we definitely try, I mean, being a small business ourselves, we understand that sometimes investing in marketing and technology is just not feasible at the current moment. So we recommend kind of grassroots things, whether that's, you know, a zoom call like this, where we record a conversation and then leverage that in social media video. It's, it's very easy. It takes an hour and the editing is really not that difficult. Or we even propose, you know, we we did this with a client a few weeks ago where we went on site to their office for an hour or two and took just with our cell phones and a tripod stand and was like, we're going to interview your teammates. We have a series of questions and now we have content that can last us through the end of the year. So I think just kind of thinking about ways to, to you know, do it yourself in a way, um, but still produce that high video uh, content. It's uh, that's fine. I mean, and also when you think about it, when you're on Instagram, not everything you see is tens of thousands of dollars in high production value. A lot of it is just in, or iPhone videos. Yeah, it's everything we've been seeing is that's that's what's performing better anyway, mm-hmm. is like the the stuff that seems a little more authentic, seems a little bit rougher. Um, yep. So hopefully that makes it actually a little bit easier to to get away with it too. It's kind of nice that that's how it's how it's come out with. Yeah. And anybody can be a videographer these days, which I don't know yeah. if it's a good thing, but good thing for clients. <laughs> Awesome. That's a really good point. I like, I kind of like how uh, it sort of levels the playing field, especially for smaller businesses. And I'm wondering if you've seen any kind of struggle with that um, in terms of, I know we've seen user generated content typically does really, really well, as opposed to that really polished, Mm -hmm. um, you know, video content that they're producing with maybe a whole production team. But if you're just turning on your iPhone and just talking from the heart about your business and why you created it and happy customers taking their own uh, Instagram reels about what they love about your product. Sometimes that performs so much better than just a standard um, video produced to talk about their story and put out on YouTube. Yeah, for sure. And, And one of our team members actually shared a few weeks ago a stat that's like Instagram favors videos that are shot with the perspective of looking at the person versus necessarily other sorts of shots. So that also goes to attest that, you know, selfies slash more user generated content probably is best performing. Definitely. So we're substantially into this interview. We haven't uh, gotten to the main topic that we had laid out. So I'm interested to hear kind of what, when somebody comes to you and maybe they've started a little bit with content or, um, you know, they, you're kind of inheriting a client from a, another agency, what are some like the top mistakes that you see people making in content right now? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a few of them that come to mind. Um, so I can touch high level on each of them. Um, happy to have deeper conversations about um, whichever we want to go into. But the first, and I've said this, I've had a few other interviews and this is always my go-to is, um, mistake number one is uh, writing for your boss and not your c- customer. Um, many times, um, you know, also being both in my past experience working for agencies and also on the client side, many like you know executives, higher ups want their their uh, writers to be writing about certain topics because they feel personally that they want to write about that, they want to see that published on their site. Um, and then it comes out that it didn't perform well. Well, that's just a proof that, you know, even though your boss says that it should be written might not be exactly what the audience wants. So that's why we always recommend our clients, um, you know, whether it's surveying their, their audience or talking to their sales team to figure out what frequently asked questions are, are, are asked by their prospects, just making sure the content is being produced for the end user and not necessarily to, appease the C-suite level or whatever that, that those, those people making the decisions internally. 
I love the idea of going straight to customers and just asking them to. I think a lot of times we think about A-B testing and you know doing different things like seeing what performs from a database perspective, mm-hmm. which is great if you have the data, but oftentimes, especially when you're just starting out or if it's a, a smaller company where you just can't really run you know, five different campaigns and see which one works best if you're trying to conserve budget. So mm-hmm. I feel like that's a, a good, probably cheaper way to do it is just, just get a couple of top customers on the phone and just ask them. Yeah, exactly. And I think that mistake kind of goes into another one fairly similarly um, is, you know, m- wanting to try out all of the new marketing, you know, gadgets, tools, platforms out there just because they're, they exist rather than using them because there's actually a purpose for your business. Um, we, you know, have experienced that in the past sometimes where that people or clients are like, well, should we be using TikTok? And we're like, <laughs> well, your audience are, you know, older males, uh, you know, 50 to 60. So probably not that they're not on TikTok. So um, I think just thinking about content and avoiding that mistake is you also don't want to burn out your, your team. You don't want to be on every single social media platform because they exist. And then your team also has to churn out specific content for each channel. So just being really purposeful and strategic with what marketing channels you are using um, and making sure that's right for your audience. Would you say that's the same for trends and maybe if they are on TikTok, certain sounds or or music (laughs) being played? Because I I know that there's quite a bit of pressure on social media managers to hop on every single trend and try to somehow form it to the business and be (laughs) as uh, an advocate as they can for their brand using just like really off the wall or non sequitur type stuff that wouldn't normally fit. How do you guide your clients in that kind of realm? You know, you're exactly right. It has to do with the, also the trends, the sounds, what's what's trending on these platforms. And, and what we do to guide our clients, we, we kind of put them in a perspective of, does this really fit with your brand? Would you be telling your, your friend or your neighbor something like this, but using like, you want to be authentic. And so we try to guide them of like, well, I don't know, like if one comes to mind about um, the the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. And so there was a lot of bits, as we all know, that came out of that. And so a few of our clients was like, were asked us like, oh, should we get on this? And we're like, I'm not really sure just because it's trending in pop culture. I don't know if we want to position ourselves in this conversation. So just trying to give, you know, level set. We definitely want to be um, honest and, you know, push our clients in the right way. So just trying to be like, have an open up conversation with them and guide them in the right way. That's such a good point. I think actually Duolingo's uh, social media team got in a bit of hot water for their jumping on that trend. So I think that's some really great guidance. (laughs) And Duolingo, in fact, I mean, everyone wants to be them on TikTok. Like they're like kind of like the the star child using that platform. And you're right, they got in a bit of trouble. So that's a perfect, perfect example of just because it's existing in the world doesn't mean we have to tap into it. Yeah, that's a really great point. <laughs> I think that touches on your burnout concept too, that, you know, don't try to attract one of these massive brands like Duolingo and try to do everything that they're doing. You know, oftentimes with these smaller brands, we, we tend to say like, you only have X amount of content or only have X amount of budget in the paid side or whatever it is. Like there's a a finite resource there. So why not try to spend it just on, you know, the one or two things that are most likely to work first. And then you can test different things after that. Or, you know, if it catches on, start to expand. If you have more budget, when things are going a little bit better or whatever it Mm -hmm. is, but yeah, I think that can be a problem where you take those limited resources and try to split it over 10 platforms or 10 different trends within one platform. It's like, let's just try to focus on one thing first and get it to work. And then we can go try some of the other stuff out. Yep, exactly. Sorry, do you hear my dogs? I told you they're going to make an appearance <laughs> in the hallway. That's um, perfect. <laughs> but that also brings us to my next mistake that I had here, I think, on the flip side is... Um, making sure you're creating content that can be reused and recycled across different platforms and over time. So trends don't really lend themselves to that. You know, it's the the lifespan of TikToks and sounds is like the shelf life is a week, maybe like at most. And so after that, like if you don't get your things together and post something, you're late and it's not going to have the performance that it should. 
So we highly recommend clients, especially with small teams and small marketing budgets to make sure they're creating content that can be reused in a way where, for example, if you write a long form blog post, can we turn it into a infographic, a set, a statistic graphic on Instagram or social? Can we um, make a sound bite out of it? If it's a video interview like we're doing, can we put a one minute clip on, on LinkedIn? So just kind of thinking about ways to stretch the content um, that can make it last over time. So your team is also not having to churn out content um, every single week. You know, one uh, medium that I think does this really well are podcasts when they record themselves sort of in a way that we do, that they will have the podcast, but then they'll also, like you mentioned, make a short clip to put on Instagram or on Facebook. And I feel like I have seen so many times that the, that's been so effective in gaining new listeners for their podcasts. So making an audio format turn into a visual or a visual into audio, I think is brilliant. Yeah. Reuse the content that you have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we've seen that also perform really well with a few clients we have where their, their service is gated. Like you have to become a, a customer to actually experience. They, they can't give away too much, but by doing little clips of and teasers of what's inside this platform, when you become a user, that has worked really well because you're, you're reusing your product in a way that can get more customers. That's smart. <laughs> That's a smart way to do it. Tease them. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, just checking out my list here. Um, let's see. I think another um, mistake here, and, and this ties into your company as well, is depending solely on either organic or paid rather than integrating them in some way. Um, you know, we're obviously, we specialize in that organic content creation aspect, but we also recognize that you're, you can't achieve every single thing with just organic socialists. There's this crazy stat, I'm sure you all know this. It's like an organic Facebook post only reaches like 5% of your following. And if you don't have that many followers on Facebook, they're not probably not going to get a lot of eyeballs on that. So pairing two different types of approaches and strategies is always really important um, and vice versa, making sure you're not only doing paid, even though, you know, that might get the quickest results or, you know, it definitely doesn't take as long as SEO optimizations, which can take months, but there's a time and a place for both of them. And usually that's somehow integrated together. That's something I actually wanted to ask you about was the state of organic on social in particular Facebook and Instagram. I've heard from a lot of small businesses that it's just not the same as it was before. So what, what's, what are your thoughts on that? What are you telling your clients? We are, I mean, I think being open to trying, like we talked about like the video and doing what you can with what we know performs well, um, you know, the video app content, also having more conversation. You can't just post it and forget it and expect it to perform well. So we always recommend including a community management aspect on social. I mean, really that's what social media is for. It's not just for projecting or promoting your business. You wanna have conversation, you wanna engage customers. And so creating this environment where it's more of a two-way conversation. Um, so that's kind of one, aspect of what we'd like to do. And then the other is this paid idea. Um, again, we, we lean on experts like yourselves to help put, put together a paid strategy, how we can leverage the channels that we're already using for our clients. So definitely exploring and letting them know, like, for example, LinkedIn is also really expensive compared to Facebook. So just kind of setting expectations with clients of like your $50 boost on LinkedIn is not going to do, do you much good. It's just you know, so it's kind of like a, I guess, a balancing act between the two. I'm curious with that community management, we've had some, some level of like concern, especially with running paid on the social channels of like, Hey, I'm running an ad and I want to test it out and see where it's going to go. And depending on if Facebook or Instagram puts it out to the wrong people, we don't want to get negative comments, especially on an ad where they're going to live there on the ad forever. And we're you know paying to put those negative comments in front of someone else. I'm curious if you have any kind of opinions on that, or should we be, you know, part of that curation is deleting those comments or what, what's the, what's the take there? Yeah. So we've experienced this in a past, the past with a few clients and, you know, there's always going to be trolls on online, like there's no escaping it. And so I think there's a delineation of you could probably delete comments from true trolls of like, they're just in it to leave a nasty comment, but 
for the comments who are still, you know, they might be concerned about your actual service you provide, or they might have a question or somehow put your business in a light that you might not see favorable. It's still, I think, important to at least reply back and make make an effort to show that you, you want to resolve an issue or you want to address their question rather than completely censoring it out. Um, so I think there's two different cases. And, and along with that, when we do onboard a client with like a social media retainer or something, we'd like to also put in place like a workflow. Like if we receive these comments or questions, how would you like us to respond? Who should we send this comment to? Uh, what cu customer service rep, things like that. So just kind of putting in place that framework and that workflow, I think will also help that. It's a great way to think of it too, in, in terms of, because I feel like that's another one of those overwhelming things where it's like, oh man, I'm going to put this out into the world. And then I don't know how many comments I'm going to get. And I'm going to have to reply to all of them. So yeah. finding a way to, to systematize it and you know use the same answers for the same types of questions and mm -hmm. use different team members in different situations, I feel like can help a lot. Yeah. And I think this conversation goes into um, one of the last the last mistakes I have on this list to talk about today is assuming content creation, content management doesn't take a lot of time or that anyone can do it. Um, I think there's a perception and you might experience too where people are like, oh, it's just a blog post. Why can't we do that in-house? Or why does it take you so long to do this? It shouldn't. It's just a Facebook post. And I think that they're, you know, they think that it's just words or it's just like, just push post and you're done, but there's just so much more to it than that. And so, you know, when we, you know, send over proposals to clients, they might have um, concerns with the hours or the workload, but once we kind of explain to them what goes in it and the importance of all of these processes, they, they start to understand like, oh, okay, it's not just pushing tweet on in Twitter and then you're done. That's not, that's not it. So um, I think clients should come in with an open mind when they start working with an agency. Um, they clearly have a need for marketing in one way or the other, and just having an understanding and respect for our trade too. You know, we, we've been in the business, both of us have experience with clients. So I think just kind of respecting that level um, and then just being excited for the results because you're working with, with experts. It's a really, really good one. I feel like oftentimes it's kind of a race to the bottom because there are agencies out there that are probably doing it for a quarter of the price you're charging or half the price you're charging. And it's we've used a lot of different content services here and there. And oftentimes the the cheaper ones, it's, you know, it's okay or it's fine, but it just misses the mark just a little. And it's like, you know, you'd pay exponentially more for something that really hit it perfectly and hit the brand voice. And, you know, as a business owner, you didn't have to worry about and get in there and make edits to the post every time they go out. Um, so yeah, I think it, it is really interesting that the, uh, I don't know if it's content as a field specifically, but I find in content, um, yeah, it seems to me that it's just like a really wide range of costs. And then like at the high end, it's, it's amazing the difference and it's hard to kind of quantify exactly what that that yeah. good content is mm -hmm. and that's why it's sometimes tricky for us when we're asked like okay can you send me over like a rate card or something like we can but it would be better and more effective if we better understood your exact needs and your goals so we can put together actually a custom plan to reach them um so it's not as black and white as some clients might assume and you probably see that too definitely I have a, another out of left field question. Uh, what are you excited about in the content marketing space? I think it changes. There's just so much happening in it. It's, it's constantly evolving and things are constantly moving around. What's something that you're excited about in the space right now? Oh, wow. I think what's exciting is that it's always changing. I think, you know, with the example of video, we've gone from something where, we just created, you know, years in the past, it's like, okay, we're just going to post a static post on Instagram. And then it's kind of transformed into, oh, wow, Instagram stories, like these are cool. Like, how can we use polls and quizzes? And now it's like, okay, now we have to put all of that in a video format. So I think what makes content marketing so exciting is just being able to mix strategy and creative and figuring out, you know, what, what comes next, what comes next for different industries, types of clients. Um, so I think overall that really is what excites me about the future. 
I love that. I feel like that's the mark of a good agency too. If you're out there looking and interviewing agencies, if there's one that's just dead set on a real static strategy, that's been working well for many, many years, that should be a red flag because everything is so uh, dynamic and changes constantly that we all have to be reviewing our strategies and staying uh, at the top of the news because it, it is just constantly changing. So if you think you've got the best strategy that's been working for years and years, probably not. <laughs> you're probably missing out on some stuff. Yep. Definitely. All right. Well, this has been a really awesome conversation. I feel like we've taken uh, definitely enough of your time. And, and I think this is probably one of our longer interviews, but just like so much valuable insights. I think we're probably going to have to have you back to uh, do this again and cover some more. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. specifically on video and all the uh, kind of different avenues and, and types of content we can go into. Um, but yeah, I'd like to give you just a little bit of a uh, spot for a, a shameless plug here. Why don't you tell us, um, you know, obviously we talked a little bit about Agency 102 earlier, um, but what, uh, where can people go to find you? And uh, yeah, how, how do people work with you? Sure, yeah. Well, thanks again for having me on. This has been a great conversation. Um, and in terms of getting in touch with us, you know, check out our website, agency102.com. Send me a direct email. It's hannah at agency102.com. Um, but yeah, we, we're really looking to create partnerships with clients looking to step up their content game. Um, even if you don't, you don't know where to start or you know you need it, but you don't know why or how to get started, that's really where we shine and can come in and be a partner through it all. Um, so yeah, I also, like I alluded to before, I have a LinkedIn newsletter, 102, 102 words or less. So subscribe there. I, I keep up as much as I can, but so for some more content marketing tips and insights. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a great group of uh, content specialists, content marketers, and we just love working with clients who appreciate content. Awesome. And I can definitely, uh, can definitely give uh, my stamp of approval on the newsletter I've been following for a little <laughs> while. It's been really, really helpful. Thanks. Glad, glad it has been. Awesome. So I think it's time for what's good. We'll uh, bring our good news of the week here. Uh, Lindsay, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so mine's maybe unsurprisingly food related. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last night we revisited a recipe and I don't know if you ever have those recipes that you used to make like all the time, maybe in college or just like starting out when you were just starting out cooking and you were like, these were go-to and then years go by and you don't make them again. Well, we just made homemade sloppy joes last night from the pioneer woman's old blog recipes that that used to be my go-to. It's better than manwich. It's better than anything out of a can. <laughs> it's so good but I forgot how easy it was. And so that's my what's good this week was that revisiting a super old recipe that I hadn't thought about in years and being like, dang, that was good. Love it. <laughs> so we ate good last night, I should say. <laughs> we'll have to make sure to get that uh, linked in the notes here. I'm going to want to try. Yes, too. please. Definitely. <laughs> Also thinking through what I can get uh, my two-year-old Jasper to eat. I feel like that might be the perfect uh, uh, food to introduce for him. Brian definitely had food. had several servings, so it's uh, guy approved. <laughs> perfect. Awesome. Um, on my side, I would say uh, I don't have a, a ton of great ones this week, but my wife and I just finished the newest season of Stranger Things. Um, I feel like last season was not the greatest, but it really came back this year. So um, yeah, just really, really enjoyed it. Would give a, a high recommendation. And of course, the, the downside now is waiting, what, another year or two until the last, uh, I think the next one is the last segment. But yeah, I thought it was uh, definitely much better than season three. Yeah, I think it's not coming back till 2024, which yeah, well, I agree, too long. <laughs> I haven't watched it yet. So I guess I have some time until the, the next, the latest season comes out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're in a good position where you can just kind of binge it all at one. Yeah. So you may even want to wait till it's done because that's my favorite when you find a season or a show that's done and you can just yeah. like binge through and you don't have to wait. <laughs> um, okay, I guess my my what's good of the week is themed, wine themed. Um, so mm -hmm. two different things. So uh, my husband and I, we again, just moved to, the, to this area and it's very close to Eagle's Nest Country Club. And so we became members just like social members and they have the best house Cabernet. And so I asked what brand it was and it's Three Thieves Cabernet. And so I looked it up online thinking that it was gonna be expensive. 
no, it, it is $9 a bottle. So I was very <laughs> excited that it's in budget. We like those lower end bottles from Total Wine. <laughs> So we'll definitely be ordering some of that. And then the other wine theme, not alcohol, but still has wine in the name, is our wine berries in our backyard are actually growing now. So we can do, they're very similar to raspberries. So I'm very excited to make some yummy desserts with them. That's awesome. That sounds good. I've never had a wine berry. Yeah, well, I didn't either until my husband started eating them right from our backyard. And I was like, are they okay? <laughs> that would have been my first thought too. <laughs> no, but we're still here. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> well, great. Those are some good, uh, good what's good today. So, all right. Well, I think um, that's all I had for today. So thank you so much, Hannah, for your time. Um, everybody should go and check you out, agency102.com. Uh, obviously, we'll have all the links in the show notes. Um, but yeah, this is really great, really insightful uh, call. And we'll catch up soon. Sounds great. Thank you both. Thank you, Hannah.